This is the Loaded Radio Podcast. All right. Hey, how are you? It's Scott Penfold here for another edition of the Loaded Radio Podcast. And on the show this week, man, I'm going to be talking with Mark Jansen. He is the guitar player and co-vocalist for the Dutch symphonic metal band Epica. Yes, who are an absolutely incredible band. Of course, he used to be a part of the band After Forever prior to forming Epica. And uh, Epica have got a pretty big week coming up. They're going to be celebrating a rather significant anniversary. And there's some new music on the horizon. But it's not exactly Epica. So we'll be talking about that with Mark. And then as well in the second portion of the podcast, we'll be joined, as always, by Loaded Radio's own Johnny Rude, who joins us live from Las Vegas, Nevada. And we're just going to talk about what's going on in hard rock and metal. What was the week in hard rock and metal so Stick around for that by all means. But yeah, let's get down to talking to this guy here, man. He's the guitar player and co-vocalist for the Dutch symphonic metal band Epica. And he has been on the podcast before. An absolutely awesome guy. I always get to talk to him. Mark, are you there? How you doing, Mark? Yes, good to be back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, first off, uh, I, I, I'd love to really get into this. Uh, is that um, I know that uh, Simone recently mentioned that there's some new music has been recorded but it's not an Epica album per se. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, she's right. We, uh, we did a project uh, recently and uh, it's all been recorded already. It's, it's going to be released soon. And uh, it's, it's a kind of, yeah, the best way to describe it is that it's a, a cooperation project. Uh, so with a lot of, we work with a lot of people uh, together from outside of the band, from other bands, uh, we, we wrote songs together with, with other musicians. We have other singers singing uh, our songs um, and, and their own songs. So it's like, yeah, we did everything together with them. So without telling too much, I think this basically tells it all. <laughs> yeah. So again, it's not an Epica release then you're saying. It, it is in a way still uh, Epica, but as uh, the material is often 50% written by people outside of the band, uh, you can best describe it as Epica coloring outside the lines. And um, so if you take every song separately, then you have a part of, of typical Epica elements, but also some stuff that is that we would have never done if we would have uh, made an, an album by ourselves. And that's, that was the fun of it. So it resulted in songs that we could have never made uh, by ourselves if we would have only worked within the, the team that we are used to work with. Oh, very interesting. Uh, and is there any like timeline as to when this will uh, be released? Yeah, I think within the, the next uh, two months, that, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct. But I, have to, I would have to look it up as well. Because it's already finished. We finished the, the recordings like already like three months ago or four months ago. But to make the, the LPs, that takes nowadays very long. So um, you have to make an appointment for that and then wait like five months before it's finished. So between your, you have finished the music and the release, it's, it's taking longer and lo- longer nowadays. So um yeah, for us, it's already like this This music is written and you want the people to listen to it, but we have to wait and wait and wait before it's released. But yeah, it's, it's finally going to happen now within within one or two months. Yes. Very cool. Now, did this whole sort of thing come together during the pandemic? Was that really what brought it together? Yes, the, the idea uh, came during the pandemic because we thought, what what is actually what we can do? Uh, we, we, we didn't want to focus us on what we cannot do, but what we actually can do. And as we had just uh, released a, a new album, we didn't want to right away go record another new album. So we were looking for something to think outside of the box. And this, this idea came to uh, Isaac's mind to, to do like a cooperation project. And everybody felt really good about that because that's something yeah, different, something that we could do during the, the pandemic. And something that, that gave us a lot of new energy. Can't wait to, to hear what this is, definitely. Uh, I know that you guys also have uh, something very exciting coming up. September the 3rd in Tilburg, Netherlands. It's going to be the same place you played your first show supporting Anathema back in 2002. Now, th- this is a big deal. How, how, how are you feeling about this? I feel, feel really good about it because uh, 20 years already, first of all, that's a great achievement that we are still around, still together, still having a good time together. 
And uh, then to celebrate that, that's, that's another thing that I really look forward to. Uh, we actually celebrated in the venue where it all started as well. So we did our very first show in the, in the O13 in Tilburg. Uh, we were the supporting Anathema by, the, by then. Yeah. And, um, and now we're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary in the same venue. And uh, the funny thing is uh, we played a, a set, the very first show, and there's got to be a big link to, to that first set that we played. So we, we have a support act uh, ourselves uh, as the Herodist. Under that name, we played the very first show. Mm -hmm. So there will be a, a lot of stuff uh, yeah, coming by that, that, that has a link with that very first show. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And also, there, there's some songs that we haven't played in, in, in many, many years that, that we're going to play again for the, for the first time in like 15 years. So it's, it's exciting. That is cool. Now, is there a way that Epica fans who can't be there in person, there's a way that they can share in this celebration? Yes, for, uh, because it was pretty fast sold out. And then we decided to, to do a, a live stream of this show. Um, so, so people from all over the world can, can watch the, the, the show live on the live stream. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we could do this, set this up because uh, there were so many people asking, yeah, it's sold out, we cannot go. Or the, the flight tickets are now so expensive, we, we cannot go. Is there another way to, to watch a show? And then we discussed it and then we, we found a way to, to do it as, uh, yeah, set up this live stream. And uh, yeah, and it, it, the only disadvantage is, yeah, there's now an, a live stream. So an extra reason to be nervous about, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it is. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the last live stream I watched you guys do was the Omega Alive live stream, which was just a beautiful event. I really, really enjoyed that. So uh, yeah. how was, how, what was your experience in doing that live stream? And was that, was that the first one that Epica did? Yeah, that, that was that was the, this typical COVID uh, live stream that uh, that yeah bands couldn't do uh, actual live shows. So yeah. then uh, you you come up with with uh, a, a sort of a live stream to still be able to play a show without having an uh, an actual show with crowd, which is of course the the what we like doing the most. But this was the the thing that comes closest to what we would like doing most, and this gave us the opportunity to really focus on the on the, the, the extras, the the, the the children choir, the stage props. So we, we could do whatever our wildest imaginations were thinking about. We all could put that in that show because we said to each other, we do everything or nothing. So not not just a live stream, just to have, have a stream. But uh, if we do it, we do it all in. And that's what we did. And luckily it went all well. Because in that time, there was also in Belgium, there was a new wave of, uh, of, uh, of cases at that point. And uh, there was a lot of things getting cancelled. But we were just lucky that in that, that uh, moment of time, we could make it all happen. Uh, and and when, when, we had, uh, uh, when we had played the show, uh, it was really like a burden falling off the shoulders because there was so much um, things that could possibly go wrong. That, uh, that you don't even want to think about. But then when it was a uh, success, uh, we were extremely happy and, and still people mentioning that show. So it, uh, it, it was really worth doing it. It's just stepping away from Epica for a second, Mark, and really talking more about your career. How do you look back at your time with After Forever? Oh, now I look back just with uh, positive memories. Of course, when I, when I was just... When it just happened that uh, our uh, that we did part ways, I was really disappointed and sad yeah. uh, because there was all the things I worked for for those seven years suddenly smashed into pieces. Yeah. But when I now look back, uh, I just look back with with a great feeling. I'm really proud of what we have achieved together in the in those years, and also after my departure, what the guys continue doing. I'm really proud of them. And also nowadays I'm in touch with basically all of them. Uh, again, like Flo Janssen, I, I never lost touch with her. But oh, cool. uh, Sandra, but Sandra Commons, we we right after the split, we, we had a kind of some years that we were not in touch with each other. But then at a certain point, we started working for uh, my side project Mayan and uh, making some songs together. And that felt really like the good old days. And and still, these are my favorite songs of, of the Mayan uh, albums. The, the songs that I wrote together with him and Jacques Drisse were really, really cool songs. 
And um, so, yeah, it's uh, really happy with, with what we did. And I also want to listen back to these albums like Prison of Desire and Decipher. Yeah. I'm really happy with, with how they sound. Yeah. Well, I, I, and just looking now, I mean, working with Simone, as you have for so long with Epica now, was there, a, say, like a difference in the, there was, say, with working with Floor than there is with Simone when it comes to your extreme guttural vocals and, of course, the beauty and the melody that they would provide? Yeah, there were definitely some differences. Uh, Floor is, is, is really a power, a very powerful singer. Yeah. And uh, her rock voice is uh, one of the strongest I've ever heard in the scene. Yes. And Simone, she has a, has a different type of voice. And in her, in, with her voice, she's also one of the best vocalists that I, I've heard. But it's, 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 they have different qualities. So when you write songs for either one of the singers, you write them in a slightly different way because you write songs for for each one of them that brings their qualities best best to to light and um, so yeah i cannot tell which which one of the two i think is the the better singer and i even don't want to to choose <laughs> because yeah <laughs> they both are really amazing singers and i'm very happy to uh, to work still with simone and have worked with with floor i learned a lot from both of them and yeah, that's also why they are, I think both that they are very well-known singers in the scene because they both are doing really great job. Yeah, certainly Floor, of course, a bit of fronting Nightwish right now. Um, yeah, yeah, amazing that she got that uh, that job uh, because after after forever, she she was struggling a bit for a time. She had her band revamp, but uh, she had to do many things by herself, and that uh, she she yeah got into a burnout. But then after all, everything went very well for for her. Then she joined Nightwish. She had, had also she has a solo career because in the Netherlands she's she's doing some quite some things next to uh, Nightwish as well. So yeah, she's doing really great now. That's fantastic. Now, now you did mention the band Mayan. Is Mayan still active? Yeah, even though for a, for a band like Mayan, uh, the, the, the pandemic hit really hard because uh, Mayan is, is not as big as, as Epica is. So it's much more difficult to, to get the band uh, to, uh, touring because now the costs are much higher than they were before the pandemic. But it's still active, and we also going to do uh, play a show uh, very soon, uh, the September the eighth. We're going to have uh, September seventh. First of all, we're going to have a show in Oberhausen in Germany, and September eighth, we're going to have a show in Effenach, uh, at the Netherlands, where we celebrate our ten years anniversary. So also with with Mayan, we have a celebra- celebration to 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 come up and. Uh, yeah, so in the same week, basically, we have the 20 years anniversary of, of Epica and the 10 years anniversary of Mayan. So it's uh, it's it's going to be quite a busy week for me. <laughs> yeah, man, that's going to be an awesome week for you, buddy. That's yeah, gonna be great. yeah <laughs> definitely. For somebody who is just getting into the music of Epica, what are three songs you would recommend that they listen to to get a good idea of what Epica is all about? Yeah, that's a very difficult question because it, it depends on the person that I have in front of me. Because if it's like uh, a 70 year old a classical music uh, fan that says, uh, I'm really, I haven't listened to anything else in my life than classical music, I would suggest three different songs than if it's like a, a teenager who says, uh, I'm, a, I'm a metal fan, but I don't know Epica, what, which three songs do you recommend me? So that really depends. But if I have to make like an average, I would uh, definitely uh, suggest uh, the, the most well-known Epica song, Cry for the Moon, because that's, that's, that's our number one uh, song still that people have listened to. Uh, but I would also su- suggest something of the new album, uh, something new. So that's one, is an old one and a new one, I would say from the, from the new album, um, it could be any any song from the new album Omega because I think they are almost basically all uh, equal uh, level wise, uh, quality wise. Uh, and and a third one, I would maybe take a middle one, some some something from Design Universe, and then I could take, for example, the song Design Universe itself because it's one of my favorite songs from that album. And I think then they have a pretty good overview. Excellent choices, my friend. And I agree that Omega would be a good 
way to to introduce somebody as well because i think it's such a strong release such a great album so that very cool yeah because i i've heard also from many people because when you release something yourself you you of course you love the album and every band loves their last album uh, basically every band so yeah. so did we and but then when the people started uh, commenting on the album and and many of them saying it, it, their, their favorite album uh, to date and uh, we did even a poll on our uh, fan uh, fan poll on our website where people could vote for their favorite albums and Omega ended up second after the Design Universe album. So for us, it was really great to see that uh, that the album was so well received that, that even after 20 years, almost 20 years by then, that we can still release an album that's completely relevant and, and even for many people, their favorite one. So that gave us a lot of... Uh, a good boost for the self-esteem to to also yeah continue and uh, and work on on a future one which soon enough is going to start we start and working on a future album of course with, with the big week you have coming up in september uh what are the plans for the future then what's going to be happening with epica soon after that any plans yeah then first we have that that cooperation uh, album release that's already something that uh, i look very much forward to but yeah. also the, the 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 paradiso dvd that uh, that was an old show that uh, that we hadn't released yet and uh, finally now in this 20 years anniversary year going to be released so that's also something I, I really look forward to and then in the meantime uh oh yeah for, yeah i almost forgot even that the, the us tour uh with Sabaton, uh, that that's also something that uh, really gonna gonna be fun, I think, because uh, we we saw the Sabaton guys on uh, one of the uh, some of the summer festivals this year, and we always have a good time with them. Yeah. And um, they are doing really well in the U.S. And they asked us to to join their tour, so we didn't uh, have to think twice, and we, we will join them. Uh, the visa pr- procedure is quite a pain in the ass, so hopefully <laughs> we will make it just in time with the visa. But uh, if, if that's set up, then uh, if that's fixed, and then uh, then we will uh, go on tour the, the October and November months, and uh, then after that we're going to have some South American uh, tour dates, and then it's for sure going to be time to work on uh, the new album. Even though the, the early next year, if if everything goes all right, if there's no new uh, virus sh- showing up. Hopefully, fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> then we have also uh, two tour legs with, uh, together with Apocalyptica, uh, co-headliner tour. So sometimes they are closing the night, sometimes we do. And so there's only highlights coming up. So really hope that, uh, that from here on, uh, we have some luck with uh, yeah, the, the, the global situation. But yeah, nowadays you never know. So uh, fingers crossed oh. and uh, hope for the best. That's wonderful, Mark. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to us today, man. I really do appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. And we'll talk to you again soon, my friend. Take care and all the best. And I can't wait to see you on the road with Sabaton. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, cool. And uh, see you there. (laughs) Take care. Yes, you will. Take care, sir. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. (laughs) Bye-bye. And there he is. That's Mark Jansen from Epica. And I certainly can't wait to find out what this new release is about, get more details on that. Hopefully in the days ahead, that'll be coming into light. And of course, checking out the upcoming live stream that the band's going to be doing as well for their anniversary. But hey, it's Scott Penfold here with you on Loaded Radio Podcast. And uh, we're now going to be joined by Loaded Radio's own Johnny Rood. He joins us live from Las Vegas, Nevada, where we are tearing him away from watching a this uh, documentary on Phil Hartman that he's watching. Uh, Johnny, a big fan of Phil Hartman, I'm guessing. He was he was from Brantford, Ontario, wasn't he, John? I think so. Yeah, Brantford, and then he moved when he was eight. His folks took him to California. Oh, yeah. his wife killed him, right? Yeah, his uh, third. I could be right now. I'm. He's on his second wife, um, and it could be Bree was her name. Um, oh, yeah. I haven't got there yet, but anyways, I'm I, I'm gonna miss it, but because uh, uh, it's on right now but no it's very interesting i i again i kind of like these cool little biographies uh on these random sort of people but yeah he's interesting guy man really he was a wicked artist he he did album covers for crosby stills nash he did poco he did america and that that was his he was a graphic designer and this place he worked at i've been by a thousand times on hollywood boulevard i didn't know it was uh um, I guess a graphic design 
company or there was something in there but his brother owned it and then his other brother was a tour manager uh, um, of bands so he would go on tour and he met hendrix and all these like the you know Jan janice joplin and you know beach boys and stuff but yeah he did that because he lived in california at this point um, and he was also uh, known as the voice of Troy McClure on The Simpsons. Yes, he is uh, the voice. I'm Troy McClure. But I'm he's Troy the McClure. Guy, he's the guy also, too. He was in The Groundlings with uh, Paul Rubens. Yes, Pee Wee Herman. Right. And those two wrote the, the Adventures of Pee Wee Herman. And they knew, well, everyone who was in The Groundlings, when when they started that sketch, the, the Pee Wee Herman thing, him and Paul Rubens, they wrote the character together and once it took off from the groundlings they had a, a long lineup around the block they took it up to uh hollywood Bull or sunset boulevard in hollywood and they started putting it in the roxy right. and that's when they knew they were onto something um and the actors a, a a movie from uh um the roxy and uh then they got signed i think to warner brothers uh with to, to to do the movie and he got like 150 grand and it was a brand new director i didn't know this and and it kind of i wish i didn't but uh the director of Pee Wee herman's uh big adventure was um uh, that was um uh, tim burton a uh, tim burton and yeah. i don't i don't like tim burton i know you don't yeah you're, i don't you're, like you're, his you're stuff. one of the people that doesn't like his style yeah. yeah if he sticks to his shtick it's good but when you start messing with planet of the apes no 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 that's bad <laughs> um yeah he, he the wrong guy to direct that it was it, what a shit show movie that well i even said i go not him he's yeah. great at you know the the weird avant-garde stuff but not like your fucking charlton heston action fucking movie not Classic. this guy yeah yeah um wrong guy wrong guy yeah. and of course he he always puts in his fucking chick helen and bonham carter yeah. all, every movie but uh yeah so he directed that uh Pee Wee herman's movie and i i didn't know that but i liked that that movie but that was his first movie too it was um, and it's uh it's it's actually a great movie i mean even taking away from just Pee Wee Herman as, you know, as to, to the phenomenon he become became rather in the late 80s. I mean, going back to, to them when he, he was still kind of breaking out, he wasn't really well known yet. It's a great film, man. It was a really good, I think, introduction to that character as well. Oh, it to totally was. But here here's the thing with Phil Hartman. He's only in the movie at one scene at the end of the movie. And he felt or he felt um, a little shrug by that because Pee Wee Herman became a huge star after mm -hmm. that and uh there was a couple other things that happened uh with that movie oh phil goes i fucking wrote that movie with this guy i developed that character of Pee Wee herman with him mm -hmm. and he felt a little slighted um but an odd guy phil and he's at the very end of the movie he enters or interviews the guy who stole Pee, Pee Wee's bike that's right i remember and uh he's basically troy mcclure that's, yeah. the that's the character he's an interviewer guy and he felt he should have got a little more um accolades for that movie because he wrote it all the weird bits too he wrote the the big the, the part about the big trucker guy coming after him at the dinosaur he wrote right, yeah phil's bit was the biker bar and 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 all the large marge stuff. yeah all the classic stuff was yeah. phil's writing and he right. felt uh, a little slighted and that's where i am right now well he had a good run on saturday night live he, he was he was oh, really yeah, yeah outside of that that movie came out in 85 and phil eventually became a huge star but he's saying when when that happened uh after that movie there was nothing you know 85 like, was a great year though man for oh, not, not, not just year. for films but for fucking dude i love the music yeah. that came out in yeah, 85 doc and back for the attack came out then and uh, oh dude uh yeah 85 was pretty good uh i think that's so many when, great uh, albums uh metallica's master of puppets yeah girls 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 i think girls, girls. no no uh, theater of pain wasn't it theater of pain theater yeah. of shame yeah, theater of shame that wasn't very good from 82 even 81 and when when peewee's uh big adventure was at the roxy that was around 81 82 yeah that, uh, that was debuting and so that movie came out in 85 so mm. It took about four years for production and, and writing, but um, yeah, great, great year for music, uh, 80, all of that stuff from 81 mm -hmm. to 87. Yeah.
was good. Yeah, that's the run there, man. That, that's, yeah, that's, that, definitely, that's the Sunset Strip run right there. Yeah, it was, it was killer. <laughs> Did you know that on this date back in 1996, John, the October Rust album by Type Negative came out? In what year? 96. I just saw Johnny Kelly update that, uh, yeah, drummer that, for the band. That, um, yeah, that's a great record. It's an incredible record, man. It's, it, it's I think, one of the uh, unsung hero 90s metal albums out there. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny. Uh, again, going back, uh, you know, the story of me hanging out and stuff like that. Um, and he was in that other kind of no name band, the Carnivore. Carnivore, that's um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, Typo 96. Yeah. I, I, God, man. I, I, they, they played on the Danforth Music Hall. Yeah. Um, and I just remember that uh, the complaints that happened because of the volume <laughs> of that show in the na- in Greek in Greek town in, in, Toronto. in Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, I think, the the last show that ever happened, a, like metal show that ever happened there. Pretty sure it was a Danforth Music Hall. Like, don't, don't quote me, but I just know it was a big deal. And, well, the music and, hall, is, they, they got new owners now. It's been totally redone. I mean, I just saw Kill Switch Engage there a few years ago. So there is metal yeah. there. So, I would think that, that there, if it was there, you'd have to maybe Google this and find out. I just know it was a big deal that yeah. uh, the complaints that happened after this typo negative show. Um, <laughs> but going, but been, early typo, you, you met them in New York, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah, it would have been 89, 88, somewhere oh, wow. in okay, there. So very yeah, early typo. Oh, very. Yeah. There was no typo. It was there was no carnivore. such thing as type. It was carnivore, and he was just a tall, skinny, cool guy with a cop hat on. And yeah. I was at a, a club called the Scrap Bar, and Joey Ramone was there, and Slash, and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't give a shit. I was there hanging out, drinking, doing my own shit, and it was just cool, man. But I just remember him coming up to the bar and saying, "Excuse me," <laughs> and uh, he kind of, I let him in. You guys, it was a small bar, yeah. and. Uh, there was him and Slash was on the pool table making out with some chick and Joey Ramone was standing there. Um, and this big, tall dude, oh, I'm Peter Steele, you know, I'm, who's that guy? You know, just again, a massive presence, six foot seven. No, oh, nice, dude. <laughs> really cool dude. And we had a drink. And yeah, that was way before typo negative. Oh, man. But yeah, it's still just to, to, to have been able to have a drink with Peter Steele, dude. I mean, a lot of people wish oh, they, they could say they could have done that. And then seeing them and then ended up working with them. I mean, yeah. doing production with that's, uh, uh, you know, I think it was the world, uh, world coming down to, I've t- yeah, two world coming down. Times, yeah, two or three times I worked with them and he would just be, he had the bottle of wine on his, on his mic stand and all these chicks, <laughs> you know, people <laughs> I knew just sitting on the side of the stage for yeah. Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was his charisma dude. And, um, you know, the, the Playgirl uh, centerfold helped quite a bit, I'm sure. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was, the, that was the thing, his magnetism. And, uh, you know, he was this gothic vampire of a guy, uh, but yeah. just a cool, cool guy, man. The whole band, I can still see it now as I'm telling you this story. I can still see the show and all green. They, uh, for some odd reason that, you know, that Adams family-ish uh, green Munsters uh, vibe lighting yeah. it was really cool dude uh, but yeah i worked with them a few times you know unfortunately i never w- had the chance to see typo negative um i've talked to johnny kelly of course um yeah he, you know i uh, here on loaded radio and um a great guy it was great talking to him just about his memories of peter as well yeah, october rust was his first album with the band because sal abrascato yeah from, left yeah he ended up going to or was involved in Life of Agony. Oh, Life of Agony, right. Yes. Yeah, Life of Agony. It's funny, dude. I look at an old um, flyer and there's uh, Life of Agony uh, opening for us. It's, uh, you know, back in New York, dude. I, oh, wow. I, I, I look at some of this stuff. I'm like, holy crap. And I dig that. I had no idea they were on the same bill um, hmm. or the same weekend, whatever we were doing. But yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, man. And I just read something about Life of Agony. Oh, they, they had to stop a tour. Their bass player collapsed. The girl. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah that's, I heard something about that. Yeah. 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 Uh, but yes, the Johnny Kelly, I think that's the record he joined. I, I, I just think that the music's great. I love Typo Negative, as you know. I mean, I'm a big fan. We, we do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every, every Tuesday on the quint- radio station. Yeah. Quintessential record is October Rust. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it, it's, it's a great 
album to introduce you to the band type. Yes. Be, that's for yes. sure. And then yes. you can go a little bit deeper, you know, and uh, there's some phenomenal albums. Uh, what, Bloody Kisses. Uh, Bloody yeah, Kisses, Blo- World Coming Down, like you had mentioned, is a good one. Um, they're uh, all good. Yeah, they're all good, man. All, they're all good. They, they all had the their sound. Yeah, yeah they had their own. So no one sounded like them at that no. time. I mean, there's there's gothic bands, but th- th- that's a gothic metal, uh, and it's really cool. They had yeah. their own look. They had their own sound vibe. I remember when they, I think it was Wacken Festival, they went over there, and, and I'm not sure if they headlined it, but they were one of the top headliners, typo negative. Yeah. You know? Garbage men from New York City. Yeah, that's right. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing, dude. Yeah, it, it, it's cool. All right. Thanks, Johnny, for joining us as always. And hey, thanks for tuning in to the Loaded Radio podcast this week. We'll be back again next week with an all new edition, an all new interview, and more discussion. As always, check out loadedradio.com for all your hard rock and metal news as well. The 24 hour radio station. You can find us there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, past podcasts, and so much more stuff. I mean, we're talking serious metal content. Check it out, loadedradio.com. As well, download the Loaded Radio app. You can take Loaded Radio with you wherever you go. All right, I'm Scott Penfold, and on behalf of everybody else at Loaded Radio and LoadedRadio.com, we'll talk to you again next week right here on an all-new edition of the Loaded Radio podcast. Loaded Radio.